So for today, uh, we have uh, Roy Atkinson. Roy is the president of HDI of Northern New England, serving Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. As an IT professional, one of his primary goals is to provide customer service excellence at every step of every interaction. As a consequence of his frequent writing on the topic of customer service, Roy has become a co-host of the weekly CustServe Cust chat on Twitter. Uh, so again, that's C-U-S-T-S-E-R-V chat on Twitter, which has attracted participants from Australia to Europe. Uh, frequent uh, tweets include um, customer service practitioners, authors, business school faculty, and others. Roy is also the co-author of the ebook Customer Service 101 with Leslie Knight. And just a couple more things on Roy. Roy has worked with the committee who brought the HDI Global Manager of the Year Award into being. He serves on the HDI Northeast Regional Leadership Council and was one of the judges for the 2010 Global Team Excellence Awards. Roy was co-author of the HDI Social Media White Paper in 2009. He's a certified support center manager and a veteran of HDI's conference faculty and he's also spoken at the New England Support Symposium 2010, uh, various local chapter meetings, user group meetings, and events such as the HDI Northeastern Regional Summit. So very, very well spoken and out on the circuit. He's also presented at the Toastmasters Leadership, Leadership Institute in 2010. And then finally, he's been interviewed for ComputerWorld.com, uh, MeetTheTweets, and Servicesphere.com. So with all that fantastic bio, I'm going to turn it over and uh, enjoy the next uh, 30 minutes with, uh, with Roy. Roy. Thanks very much, Rick. It's a pleasure to be back here on Thought Rock Live. And today we're going to talk about customer service excellence, what it means, how you figure it out, and what you do with it when you, when you have it. There's the uh, hashtag, by the way, for the customer chat, which happens to take place this evening, and I'll mention that again later on. So customer service excellence, what is it? Is there a real definition for this, or is it just one of those, well, you know it when you see it? And actually, there's both. And we'll talk a little bit how, about how it relates to both internal and external support. Maybe you deal with customers who call your company for products or services. and Maybe you provide support internally to employees. And I'll talk a little bit about whether or not there's a framework for it. Those of you who are familiar with ITIL know all about frameworks. And then we'll also mention some new social media considerations. Now, there's no presentation that's complete without at least one cycle diagram. So, whoop, there it is. This shows the five key elements of customer service excellence. And they're not static. There is a continual service improvement pro uh, cycle here, just like ITIL v3. You go around, and then you go around again. These elements were researched and stated as a part of the Customer Service Excellence Framework, which was developed by the UK Government Cabinet Office. As you may know, ITIL was developed uh, by the uh, Office of uh, the Stationary Office. It was governed by the Stationary Office in Great Britain. So this is another framework that came out of the UK government, and this one's specific to customer service excellence. And, and Roy, can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by specifically by framework? I know different terminology is thrown around in our industry, so just if you could expand on that, that'd be great. Sure. There's, there's sometimes it's a little difficult to understand the difference between a framework and a methodology. Uh, people sometimes confuse ITIL with a methodology, that you have to do things according to ITIL and that you have to comply with ITIL. Whereas basically what a framework does is it gives you some points of reference. And uh, through research and surveying and so forth, it develops a, a building in which you can then build the systems that provide whatever it is to your end users, whether it's good IT service or whether it's good customer service, good product service, whatever that happens to be. So a framework is not a methodology, but it does have good practices or best practices involved and gives you uh, some points of reference in which to develop your service delivery. So let's start at the top right. We're going to go clockwise here and talk about insight. So in order to best serve your customers, you need to understand what your customers need and what they want, which are not necessarily the same things, especially if you've been involved in IT support, you know that. What they want may not be what they really need. 
but you can't allow in innovation to be overwhelmed by what the customer wants. And there's a great quote from Henry Ford, if, you, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. They never would have built the car. So you have to temper what you hear from customers. And we'll get into insight. I, I love the graphic on this, by the way. That's how I feel sometimes. There are two basic definitions of the customer when you look at the dictionary. These two definitions are one and two from uh, uh, dictionary.reference.com. One who purchases goods or services, so that's an external customer, somebody who's buying services from you. And then the second one is a person one has to deal with, and that generally is your internal customer, the employees that your service desk, desk supports or uh, people that you work with internally in your organization. You can say, well, I have to deal with them. They don't have a choice and neither do you. It's not brain surgery. So let's talk a little bit about uh, customer insight. How do you gain it? There's one way, which is try to see things the way customers do. And some people are very, very good at this. When you walk into a restaurant or a store that it, you find very appealing and things are laid out in such a way that they're easy for you to understand and get to, somebody has been through there that has a good ability to see things through the customer's eyes. A lot of times that's a new business where they put a lot of thought into how it's going to look when they first open. And over the years, sometimes it tends to go downhill. So that's one thing look at it through the customer's eyes. Another way is to gather available information and how do you do that? Well, you listen to your customers. And I had to put an OMG in there because believe me, there are people who can't imagine actually listening to what customers are asking for and what customers really want to tell them. And uh, that wanting to tell, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. This is not rocket surgery. So what do you learn from customer insight? What they need, so you can do that, and what they expect, so you can exceed it. Because most people, most people don't have exceedingly high expectations. When they ask you to deliver a service, they expect to get that service uh, in a timely fashion, but they don't expect the moon from you. Some do, but most don't. And so if you can exceed their expectations, or you know, at the very least you want to meet them, and if you can exceed them, you're on your way to customer service excellence. So who are these customers? Well, they're both the people who come directly to you, who might call you at the service desk or come to buy your product. But they might also be someone else, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Well, there might be a broader base of customers that you'll be dealing with, and those people might be really the ones who are going to drive your behavior in terms of delivering service excellence. You need to engage with the customers, and, and we'll go into some depth on this, and methods that you can use to both learn from and to teach your customers to deliver information to your customers and to get information and intelligence from them. And then you're going to take the, all that information, you're going to learn from them, you're going to review what you need to do to improve. Now this particular set of bullet points is taken directly from the customer service framework that I was talking about before in the cabinet, UK cabinet office. Identify, engage, learn, review, and improve. Those are big steps in terms of pursuing customer service excellence. So who are your real customers? I, I mentioned this in the previous slide. Internal, well, IT employees, if you think about your operational level agreements that you have, perhaps the uh, desktop support folks have an OLA with the system administrators because they need some services provided in order to deploy software. If you're outside of IT in an organization, you might think of your service level agreements, which means you have an agreement with IT about the services they're going to deliver to you, what the service levels will be, and what you can expect. Once you go outside the organization, you have to think about both your company's public, and by that I mean the customers who come to you asking for your products or services and willing to purchase them, and your company's public's public. 
what do those people do with your products? Let's say, for example, you are a purveyor of electronics, and your electronics are used in the healthcare industry. Well, then your public's public are the people who are affected within that healthcare industry. Maybe it's diagnostics that you deliver, diagnostic monitoring systems, something like that. I know of one organization that uh, delivers a support to dialysis units all across North America. And so when they think about customer service, they not only think about the person, the technician or the nurse who's calling them because there's something wrong at the dialysis station, they also think about the person who's in the dialysis chair at that time, and they try to think of that person as their customer. So sometimes you have to think through the immediate contact one level beyond. Perhaps an administrative assistant who's calling you with a problem for Microsoft Word, let's say, is really trying to get a $6 million grant written. And that affects your entire organization. So you can't only think about the person who's on the other end of that phone or sending you an email or however they're contacting you. Sometimes you have to think beyond them to what their obligations are and try to make their life easier. Because ultimately, when you're doing customer service, that's what it's all about. So now we'll take a, a, another step down the, the magic wheel of fortune here, and we'll think about organizational culture. I can tell you from doing about a year of the customer service chats on Twitter now that culture is a word that comes up again and again and again in terms of how some organizations are great with customer service and some aren't. It really does revolve around a culture. So the foundation of customer of service excellence is a customer focused organization. And again, what I mean by customer focused organization is every aspect of that organization that has anything to do with customers and pretty much everything has to do with customers is focused on the customer side of things looking at things through the customer lens, seeing things from their perspective. Recently, I was at a store, and they had a customer service desk. There's a big sign over the desk that says customer service. Well, that's fine, but all around that sign were other signs that said, according to our policy, you can't do this. We have a policy that says you can't do that. Well, that's not customer focus. The opposite is customer focus. What can we help you with? What can we enable you to do? So there's, again, these come from directly from the, the uh, customer service excellence standard that was researched by the UK government. Commitment to putting the customer at the heart of service delivery, uh, supported and sponsored by the organization's leaders. That's a biggie. If you don't have buy-in from on high, all the way up to the top, all the way to the sea level, uh, you are not going to have a truly customer-focused organization. And as I was just talking about, policies and procedures that support the customer. Try to think about what you can do for the customer as opposed to what you can't do for the customer. And it makes a huge difference. Um, every organization has a culture, and uh, there's a great quote that Leslie and I did in our little book about Customer Service 101. It says, your employees will treat your customers as well as you treat them and know better. Meaning, if you're the CEO of a company and you have a customer interaction, if you turn around and say, well, they don't know what they're talking about anyway, your employees will pick up on that. If you're the manager of a service desk, your customers, your employees will pick up on your attitudes towards your customers. So everything needs to be focused on the customer service. Roy, I got a question uh, with respect to the culture. Um, <clears throat> so, from from your experience, I'm assuming uh, you know you've worked in you've worked in and you've also probably consulted with or, or talked to different organizations. So, I hear what you're saying in terms of the culture is often defined at the C level. But for the folks that are on the line today and, and, and are listening in, what are some of the things that you would recommend that 
you know, whether it's you know a service manager or anybody that's in management and IT, what can what can they do regardless of the overall C level corporate culture to to really take some practical steps and, and think about how to incorporate or, or create this customer focused culture? Anything practically you can say that over you know through your years of experience that has worked when people have had to kind of do it within their own IT organization, even if it necessarily wasn't being driven at the C level? Absolutely. First of all, you're responsible for your own responses to your customer interactions. So you really have to take ownership of your immediate relations with the customers. When you're talking to them or working with them, you need to be focused on what they need, what they want, and how you can best deliver that and assist them because they're trying to get work done. And ultimately, the support organization, the support center and desktop support, and all the parts of the support organization and any organization are to um, minimize downtime and make sure that people can get their work done. So you're there to expedite their work day and you really need to stay focused on that. Another thing you can do is when you see or hear about a particular policy or a particular procedure that is not focused on that particular outcome, getting things done for the customer, bring it up and say, you know what, I think we could probably make things better for the people who are calling us if we looked at it this way or if we wrote this policy and let that percolate upward. You know, that whole managing up is a real key. And what tends to happen is that if there's a performance increase, if you're serving your customers better, if you're getting good reactions, if people higher up the organizational chain are hearing from people hey, you know, I call the service desk. Those guys are just making it happen. Um, they're going to pay attention, and they're going to start looking at the information that they have in your metrics. You're going to look at your customer satisfaction scores, and they're going to start saying, what are you people doing down there? You know? So there are things that you can do to drive customer service excellence upward. Does that answer your question, Rick? Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, no problem. So... There's a, one of the books that uh, I mentioned at the end here. It's called Unleashing Excellence, and a really good book about customer service. Um, one of the, the little uh, repeated mantras in the book is everything speaks, uh, the organizational culture. What are the customer perceptions when they walk in your door, when they call you on the phone? What, what is that? You know, if you answer the phone and you hear laughter in the background when you're calling the service desk, meanwhile your computer is having a meltdown, this is not going to make you happy. So all that atmosphere is really part of the customer's perception and everything speaks. And as I said, what, what's part of the customer interaction? Everything is part of the customer interaction. And that's an excellent point that's brought out in Unleashing Excellence. So here's something I spotted one day. I just shot this picture at a local big box store. And just as I was going out the exit door, I saw this. Ring the cowbell if you had excellent customer service. Well, it's a nice idea. Um, if, you, if you look at it, though, um, I can tell right away that it's going to be a little difficult to ring that cowbell because of the way the little drumstick is hung on it. It's going to be hard to turn it around and whack the cowbell. But aside from that, it's a great idea, but the execution is not very good. It looks like an afterthought, and it really was an afterthought. And what that tells me is, okay, you're trying to paint customer service on kind of a focus on mediocrity, and that doesn't work very well. That's the message I get, and that's in line with everything speaks. So this probably would have, could have been executed much better and could have been a lot of fun, but the cowbell was silent. <laughs> so your organizational culture starts right at the beginning. If your HR folks are going out and recruiting people and for your customer service organization, whatever happens to be, whether it's IT support, which is my uh, most of my background, although I did have also a lot of customer service interaction in retail, starts right with recruitment, training, and development. That starts customer focus. You hire people based on their attitudes and their abilities to pick up on people, their communication skills, all of that good thing. You then nourish staff attitudes. And then when you're done measuring all your metrics, you better have some recognition and you better link it to customer feedback. 
even if somebody's an outstanding performer from some aspects, like they pick up the phone more often than anybody else does, but if their customer feedback isn't good, then you need to think about how you're going to reward or recognize or train that person further. So there, there could be some complex information that you're going to get. These are four elements that I talk about anytime I mention customer service. Listening, empathy, clarity, and consistency. Two of them are from the customer service provider side. Two of them are from the customer side. You need to listen and hear what the customer is telling you. You need to understand what they say. And there's a pretty famous customer service story about a woman who rushes into the emergency room, runs up to the desk, and says, I need to find my sister. And so the person behind the desk doesn't know quite how to react. Because there could be a couple of scenarios here. One is she's looking for her sister who was just in a serious car accident and is now in the emergency room. And the other one is her sister's about to have a baby. So they're totally different uh, cases. And the only way you're going to find out is by asking some questions and try to understand what the person is asking you for. Then you need to communicate to them clearly and consistently. And consistency is a tough one because that involves not only you, it involves other people within your organization. A lot of times in years past, especially when somebody called the service desk and they got an answer they didn't like, they went to somebody they'd call, call back and try to get somebody else on the phone until they got the answer that they liked. So the answers need to be consistent. And there's a bunch of ways to do that. Uh, working from a knowledge base, uh, scripting is pretty common, but I can tell you from a customer service perspective, it's not optimal. Roy, quick question, just just back on that. A uh, couple things on the empathy piece. The empathy piece is um, from a customer uh, service training perspective. When you look at a lot of organizations spending you know, lots of money, and they have always on uh, on training and trying to get some of these skills um, sharpened a little bit. Um, two parts to my question. One is why is empathy so important, and two is can do you believe you can train empathy? Good question. Uh, Empathy is really important as a differentiator. Uh, as I mentioned, those two instances where the woman rushes into the emergency room, how do you tell one from the other? Is she happy? Is she sad? Is she concerned? You need to understand what she's feeling. Uh, another thing might be, uh, well, word is crashing today. Well, is that really important? You know, word crashes periodically, and, and you know, how much am I supposed to care here? But if you fill in the rest of the story, and, and understand that that person's boss is under the gun to publish this particular article next week, or they lose their funding for that department, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of things, simple questions that you might be able to ask a question, uh, ask a person to understand more about why they want what they want, why they feel concerned about it at the particular time, what more of the problem is. Oh, this happens every day at this time? OK, that might point to another problem that's underlying a particular crash that's going on, or whatever it happens to be. Can you train empathy? Hmm, That's a really tough one. And I think that a lot of people involved in, in, in the service industries in general have tried to answer it. I think that to a certain extent, you can certainly train people to ask questions along a particular line that will elicit further information and help you understand what the customer's point of view is, what they're going through, why they're having a particular problem, why they're so upset. Maybe they went to your website and tried email and they didn't get an answer, and they tried Twitter and they didn't get an answer, and now they're calling you and they're really upset about a simple thing and you're not sure why. So asking good questions is something I think you can, at least to a certain extent, you can train people to do. Um, you're not asking them people so much to to uh, feel emotionally uh, what the customer is asking for, but to understand what they're, where they're coming from and what they really need. And I think to a certain extent, anyway, you can, you can train that. Some people seem to be naturals at customer service, and there's some, uh, again, there's some disparity between uh, customer service professionals as to whether that's a really desirable trait or not. So. Right. Yes and no. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I think, and I think, I guess the my my thoughts on that would be also that um, 
that needs to be part of the hiring process. I mean, there, there needs to be ways that you, a lot of these skills are skills that need to be, in, a, in an optimal situation, they're done through the hiring process as well? Absolutely. And, and that goes back to a couple slides to what I said about when, you, when you're recruiting and, and beginning the process. If you're focused on customer service right from the beginning, you're going to tend to hire people who have, at least to a certain extent, a natural aptitude for this type of work and they're going to be able to understand your customer's concern better and probably communicate it as well. And Roy, sorry, one last question here from, uh, from somebody here is that um, where in this, uh, in this grouping here when you talk about some of these key skills, four elements of customer service attitude, I guess this is attitude. I'm not sure whether or not uh, later on you talk about this, but how important is it for an individual in, in any situation? Because knowing that every customer situation potentially has its own little subtle nuances, how important is it, and I'm not talking problem solving from a process perspective, but just from a skills perspective, the ability for that for people to be able to solve problems and use, uh, use, use skills that they have in terms of problem solving? I mean, is there anything you could talk about there? I'm not sure if it's part of your, present, or part of your uh, discussion today. No, I didn't specifically address it because I think it kind okay. of rolls, rolls into the first two here. Okay. Um, I think that if you listen carefully, to what people are saying, you know, what's the Stephen Covey line, seek first to understand. Mm -hmm. it, it, if you combine listening and empathy, you identify with the person, you try to imagine what it is that they're having the problem with. If you ask pertinent questions, which I mentioned when talking about empathy, it's also going to help you in your problem solving skills. So eliciting information from them is going to be very important and, and those two first elements, especially you know, listening carefully and identifying with the customer are definitely going to get you down the road towards solving problems. Okay. Thank you. No problem. So now let's talk about information and access. And there's a, a lot wrapped up in this, so I'll, I'll get through this as well as time permits. Information about services is clearly available to people. Um, it's amazing to me as I go around the web uh, how often companies seem to have focused on hiding information. You really can't find out what you're trying to find out. Uh, and only since, really since the adoption of ITIL, uh, Information Technology Infrastructure Library, became so widespread has the idea of a service catalog really become widely adopted. And um, basically what you're doing there is actually saying, this is what we do. These are the things that we provide, and there might be other things that we don't. But here's what we offer, and that, that should be pretty clear. Clear contact information. What do I do? Who do I call if I have a question or a problem? What's, where do I go to get my questions answered? If there's any charges involved, you need to tell people right up front, not bury them. Just transparency as far as that concerns. Use a variety of channels. Um, a lot of times at the service desk now, we have chat, we have instant messaging, we have telephone, we have fax, we have email. There's a wide variety of channels that people can uh, contact us through, and we need to pay attention to those, and I'll talk more about that. And allow flexible responses and input. Something that absolutely makes me crazy is not being able to find the proper element in a drop-down menu. And uh, so you go to a website, and, and here's, here's the question. What would you like to contact us about? Choice one on the drop-down is you'd like to receive our catalog. Choice two is you need to return your product. Choice three is locate a store near you. What if it's, I just had a great experience at your store, and I want to tell you about it? How do I do that? Give me a way to provide feedback to you, I can, my, might be complaining, I might also be praising, and, and remember when you block complaints, you're also blocking praise, and that's probably something you don't really want to do. So open up the access, let people contact you. So now we have social media, and this has just really blown the doors open in a lot of respects. Um, at least listen, if you have a company that does business with the public, Somebody in your organization needs to be paying attention to what's going on on social media. Uh, if you don't have an online community, your customers will have one for you. 
and that's a direct quote from a gentleman named Barclay Ray, who's a consultant in the UK from a, a, a conference that he was at last week. Um, can you respond in the same channel? If your customers choose to use Twitter as their primary communication tool, can you do that? If you can, great. If not, maybe you need to send out a tweet from your organization with a direction of how to get help. But try to respond in the customer's channel because that's what they're, that's where they like to be. Can you be everywhere? No, I mean, look at this. There's just so many places to be in the social space that it's, it's really impossible for you to be everywhere. But if you can sift through some of the information, set up Google Alerts, whatever it happens to be for mentions of your organization, and this goes true, this is true internally as well. Um, try to keep your ear to the ground inside your organization and see how people are talking about your service. And you have great, great opportunities to learn when people don't like your service because they will probably be very willing to tell you why and maybe give you some good pointers on how to improve. Roy, I'm not sure if you uh, listened in last week. John Towsley uh, was talking about um, social media and uh, social media with inside IT service management and uh, just some innovative thoughts in the area that, uh, that I thought there might be some crossover here, so it might be some, some good follow-up. So along that lines, um, any other thoughts you have in terms of describing some of the elements of social media strategy from a customer service perspective? Uh, specifically, I can, I can talk to uh, you about uh, one of the things that I've thought about and actually did a webinar on this last week as well is leveraging social media within the organization to provide better communication between the service organization and your subject matter experts. A lot of organizations don't leverage their SMEs as well as they should. There's somebody who uses your Oracle ERP system that really knows a lot about it, but they might not be in IT. They might not be in support. You might not even know who they are, but somebody does. And generally, that's the person that other people who use that particular application will go to if they're having a problem. So if you can figure out who that is and get them a way to work with you and deliver information to the rest of the company through something like a, an open SharePoint where they can make comments, where they can look at your documents, they can look through your knowledge base and make sure the information is correct, you can leverage those people using social tools. Now, they don't necessarily have to be the public tools like Twitter and Facebook. It might be internal tools such as SharePoint they might be uh, some of the internal microblogging systems put out by Jive or uh, Chatter, Yammer, some of those uh, tools that you can use to quickly communicate with subject matter experts and they can really enliven your support no matter what it happens to be about. You can get advice from the product experts, advice from the application experts. If you go out, contact them, set up a relationship and allow them to communicate with you, generally speaking, they will do that because they want to help. They want to straighten you out, too. <laughs> right, right. Okay, great. Thanks. Sure. So let's get to the delivery part here. And, and, and I'm not going to say too very much about this, because this really is where most of the uh, effort goes into improving customer service. It's, it's at the delivery point. So everybody has done a lot of work on uh, improving the delivery. Um, you know what to do. You know that you set up service level agreements. You agree with your customers about what they can expect and you make them aware of that, whether it's through a, an end user license agreement if you're a software person or whether it's an SLA that you have if you're an IT department, whatever that is, you agree with your customers. And remember, there's usually some negotiation, not in terms of end, end user license, but certainly in an SLA there should be some negotiation. And you know, again, if you're a customer-focused organization, you're going to have a different type of end-user license agreement than if you're a non-customer-focused organization. It'll be a little bit friendlier. Uh, deliver according to the targets that you set. Measure those. Uh, you set your targets. We missed the targets. Okay, great, fine. By how much? What's the trend? What direction is it going in? So you can see how you're performing against the targets that you set. Develop and learn from best practices within and outside. So you have people who can help you identify best practices within your organization and also looking out to frameworks like ITIL uh, or COBIT or any of those. 
And then we're up to timeliness and quality and how you measure those things uh, becomes very, very important. You handle dips in performance swiftly and openly with your customers. Don't try to hide the fact that your server went down last night because people will know. People get sales orders overnight, let's say, through email, some, some uh, website that spits email into their inbox that tells them how to fill the orders. Well, if the, if the server went down, they're going to know that there weren't any orders in their inbox last night, and now they have to go back to the customers and try to find out what happened. So if you need to get right out in front of these problems and deal swiftly and openly, have clear, easy-to-use feedback and complaint system. I mentioned that earlier, and I will mention it again because it's really important. You can gather tremendous business, business intelligence if you're paying attention to what your, your customers don't like and what they do. So set some measurable standards for response across the different channels, whatever that happens to be. If you have a chat instance, set some standards. Say, we're not going to have more than six windows open. We're not going to have less than three open. We're going to respond within uh, two minutes of a chat being initiated. We're going to do whatever it is down the line, whatever your procedures work out to be. Set some standards for yourself and make sure that you can measure them. Inform your customers what those are. And then either meet them or make, make them better. And then share what you learn. It's amazing what happens when you share what you learn because what happens is you're providing information back out to your peers at the, in, within the support organization and also back out to the organization at large. And what that means is that you're cutting down on the customer's need to contact you. If you provide information that's clear and consistent, you're going to cut down the number of contacts that you have and generally speaking that will be less expensive for your organization. As the old saying, you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, and I'll have a word or two about that in a second, but it's important that you do gather some metrics and trend them over time. Have a starting point. Maybe you'll have a benchmark against other like industry, uh, you know, participants in the industry. Get customer feedback, do surveys, and share the results. It's important to share the results. Again, it's all about the openness, transparency, and access. Ask questions and act on what you learn. And I made that bold simply because there's so many organizations I've seen over the years that are really good about paying lip service to, to the whole customer focus bit, at least in the short term. They put everybody through training, they set up a system, they talk about some language, and then nothing happens. If you don't act on what you learn and you don't communicate to your customers that you're acting on, on what you learn from them, you're not going to move forward and you're not going to achieve customer service excellence. If, on the other hand, your customers tell you, boy, your website is okay, but you really need to do this, this, and this, and you say, okay, we're going to get that done, we're going to get it done by December, and then give them progress reports along the way, guess what happens? Your customers start to really like you. And uh, it's simply the exchange of information and the fact that you're acting on what they tell you. Right, quick question there. A couple, two parts to this question is how many, how many questions should be on a, do you, do you recommend anyway, should be on a customer survey? I mean, we've seen all different lengths over the years. Um, and what specifically do you ask? Uh, that's kind of first part of the question. I'll let you answer that, then ask you the second part. Okay, sure. Generally speaking, the customer survey should be as short as it can be and still give you meaningful information. And if you can keep it to five questions or fewer, you're doing great. The things that you really want to have in there are something about the overall experience. Did they have a successful interaction? Something possibly about the particular person that they contacted or the method they used to contact you. Did you have a good experience on our website? And then something about the quality of the outcome and the timeliness of the outcome. Was it done according to your expectations? And that's a problematic question, but it should be asked anyway. And the reason it's problematic 
is because everybody has a different expectation of time. I think I should send an email to the service desk and they should get back to me within two minutes. Well, that's not going to happen. And there's nothing in any industry benchmarks that says it's going to happen. Um, maybe if it's that immediate, you need to pick up the phone. So it, again, you're dealing with customer expectations, but try to try to at least pick up on what those expectations are by asking the questions. If you can't meet them, figure out ways that you can improve. And you okay. more for me? Yeah, I know, and I think that the second part of that question was just, um, you know, very specifically, I guess, from your experience, what, what do you do with uh, the data and the reports? Maybe, that, and I mean by, um, you know, what do you do either with your staff in terms of, uh, you know, executables? I mean, what, what do you do when you've got the, the, the customer survey data and you've got the reports? Now, what do you do with it? Well, I can tell you that the worst thing you can do is not uh, do anything. And unfortunately, that is also the case in a lot of organizations where they gather tremendous amounts of uh, data and have many, many reports that get generated, and then they get fed up the chain, and that's it. Nothing ever happens. So it, you need to act on what you learn. If you're not meeting targets, you need to figure out why. Maybe the target is out of your reach with the current staffing level that you have, or maybe your staff has been cut back, making that target unattainable. Maybe you need to adjust the target, renegotiate with your customers the service levels that you have. So there needs to be follow-up, there needs to be action. Don't overwhelm yourself with data. If you ask too many questions, you get too many data points, you're not going to be able to filter through it and figure out what you need to prioritize to get done. So keep it simple, keep it straightforward, and by all means, act on what you learn. Okay, great. And any specific guides or books or any resources that you found over the years have been the best source of uh, sample customer surveys? There's a great book um, that will come up on the, on the last slide that I have, which is uh, called uh, Customer Surveying. It's by Fred Van Bennekom. If I'm affordable, uh, formal rather, I'll say it's Dr. Fred Van Bennekom. Uh, who's just kind of the, the man that is about customer surveying, and it's a terrific book. It's not uh, hugely expensive, and it's not very long. It's understandable, and there's some great templates in there and some great advice on what to ask and what not to ask. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. So again, I'm just going to go through the, the, the elements that the Customer Service Excellence Standard in the UK identified through their research as being really important to get to the stage of having customer service excellence. And if you do a quick search on great customer service, there will be uh, some top 10 lists if you go back from year to year to year. Some companies tend to percolate right to the top. And if you look at the way those companies operate, what you will find is again and again, they have these elements uh, operating. Companies like L.L. Bean, companies like American Express, companies like Zappos that are really built on having an insight into their customers. There's a great customer insight from Zappos. The question that Tony Shea had to solve was how do you sell shoes to women without letting them try them on? That is a pretty impossible task right there. His answer was you give them free shipping both ways, no sweat. Let them put them back in the box and send them back with no charge and make it really easy for them to do. Customer insight. And again, the entire culture needs to really face the customer and say, how do we improve our business to meet your needs better? So this is a quote from one of the books that uh, I uh, used in preparing this, and uh, it was down the list of resources. Excellent service is rare because it takes real commitment. So there's your customer focus, there's your organizational culture. It's a commitment of the organization to make sure that customers get what they need, get what they want, and have business done with them in a manner that they expect and that they like. So you have all your processes uh, wrapped around the customer. The customer is dead center in your focus, your service delivery, your service environment, and all your processes really revolve around the customer. Look at it from their perspective, reword stuff if you need to, rethink how you deliver stuff, 
and make sure that the customers are on board with you. It's extremely important. Define your true customer. We talked a little bit about that earlier on. Think through that person who's on the phone and say, well, maybe they're trying to get this done because their daughter's graduation is this afternoon and they need to be out the door of this building by 2 o'clock, so it's really important that they get it accomplished now. Create a language of service in your own uh, group, whatever happens to be. Uh, think about ways that you can talk about customers or end users or whatever their preferred language is. I was actually surprised. I went, I went out to some end, end users and said, would you rather be called a customer or a user? And oddly enough, they said, no, oh, we're used to users. We like users. Users is good for us. Customer makes me feel like I'm going to the store, and I don't like that as much as being a user of your services. I said, great, fine, you're a user. So find out what they like. They may not like user in your organization. They did in the organization that, that uh, I was involved with. Simplify the customer experience. Share what you learn across your own internal support organization and as much as possible with the customers themselves. Open up the channels as much as you can. Let them participate in your knowledge development. Let them guide you in terms of expertise. Get those subject matter experts on, on board and try to, try to have a variety of channels available uh, to them. Um, even if you can't be everywhere, at least be in as many places as you can. So here are some, some books, um, Unleashing Excellence, which I just talked about, The Complete Guide to Ultimate Customer Service. It's really good. There are some great checklists in it that you might want to look at or copy out or make use of in your organization. Your Call is Not That Important to Us by Emily Yellen. Now, Emily is one of the frequent uh, participants in the customer service chat on Twitter. Chances are she will be there tonight. It's a great book. Uh, all about the customer service culture or lack thereof uh, in recent years. And there's Customer Surveying by Fred Van Venicom. Uh, and all of these are available uh, generally in any of the major book outlets. And then uh, Customer Service 101, which is a little ebook that Leslie Knight and I wrote. Um, it, I've given you the URL there. Uh, if you get a chance to just copy that down, there's no password or anything. Just go there, and, and the only thing there is that little ebook. Uh, download it. There's some good information in there uh, from a, from the customer perspective. And I'll just give that a second to percolate. Make sure that you have the URL. Yeah, and Roy, uh, just to let everyone know as well, this uh, this presentation will be available in Thought Rock as well. So if anybody needs to go back in and uh, and go through or get any of this information, they can get it that way. Usually within the first 24 hours, it's uploaded in Thought Rock. And the other way is uh, again either through the uh, contact information that you've given them directly or in the info at thoughtrock.net. They can always reach out if there's any additional information that they missed or that they're trying to find links that uh, they didn't get uh, they didn't get down in time. They can always uh, reach out and we'll get that out to them as well. Hey, there's some information about uh, tonight's particular chat. The topic tonight is following up with customers. And uh, we usually have, it's fast and furious. If you've never been in this chat, I can tell you, uh, hang on to your seatbelts because it is, it moves very, very quickly. <laughs>